Welcome to Films Fatal to the Flesh. Films Fatal to the Flesh seeks to examine the philosophical and psychological significance of mythology in esoteric film. We have no formal education in film or filmmaking. Our intention is to learn as much as we can from this experience and bring to light the films that we feel are meaningful. This is part two of our ongoing analysis of Robert Eggers' 2015 directorial debut, The Witch. Gil, how are you today? Great, man. How are you? Great. We saw Enemy. I'm excited. Oh, yeah. Enemy. Fantastic. Incredible film. If you haven't seen it, go ahead and see it. Yeah, but don't go to it thinking that you don't have... You don't... You're not required to think. And don't expect to understand in, immediately as you watch it or after you watch it. Yeah, no. I think it definitely takes more than one try at this film i think the only reason why i was better prepared for it my first viewing is because you talked about it so much yeah i texted you like the whole morning about it yeah but even before then you know so i kind of knew that this was going to be something that i really had to like pay attention to you know not get sidetracked not do other things not get up just plugged in yeah absolutely what an incredible film it's uh enemy 2013 dennis villanueva or villanueva as, as I've heard it pronounced. I'm not sure. Either or. Tomato, tomato. Yeah, so anyway, uh, we're back at The Witch. And again, if you've never seen the film, don't do a disturb- disservice to yourself or to the filmmakers. Go out and see it for sure. Absolutely. It's mandatory. It is. I mean, there's no other horror film like it. Absolutely not. So, we are in the forest with Caleb and William. Again, William is the father. Uh, Caleb is the adolescent or pre-adolescent son. Yeah, the oldest son. The oldest son. And they're in the forest. And here we meet Fowler. Come on, Gil. So, I'm not, <laughs> not going to do it, man. Oh, Fowler. <laughs> Gil says that all day. He won't do it on the show, though. No. That's It'll hilarious. ruin my street cred. Oh, yeah. Your black metal street cred. No, man. It's not even... Uh, I don't even think that exists for me. I mean, in any classical sense. Well, yeah. You had a show last night, actually. How did that go? It was all right. It was all right? Yeah, I mean, the... I mean, I don't want to talk too much shit, you know, but uh, the metal community here locally... It's just not a community at all. It's a bunch of... I think everybody... There's this like weird thing where nobody wants to help along bands that they don't know. You know, it's almost like this confrontation or uh, competition. You know, so this competition brings the confrontation in that there's there's just nothing there you know it's it's almost like everybody's in the back of the room with their arms crossed and i don't even know why they're there but yeah so i mean there was one person standing in front of the stage i mean the show for us went excellent you know we were right on point but there was no support well that's too bad you guys are fucking sick it's too bad that i can't reveal who your secret band is yeah but I guess that's just it's part of your ethos. Yeah, you'll come across it. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure if you look into the symbolism, uh, you might look around the pages. You might connect icons. You might connect certain pages to certain pages, and then that would kind of reveal the the secret identity. But he's not going to give it up himself. No, that's against it's... his uh, it's against his beliefs. Yep. So we're here. We're there with Fowler, and how do we come upon? Okay, actually, I don't want to spoil it. I'd actually like I'd actually like you to intro what what happens next. Um, well, they're going into the woods because William's crops are failing, so he makes this deci- decision that it's time to actually go hunt. And in the process, I I believe Caleb wasn't he didn't have any intention on Caleb going with him. 
But, you know, Caleb got up in the morning. Dad's outside getting ready to go. He's ready to go. So I think, yeah, eventually he decides to take him onto the trip. But yeah, they enter into the woods. Um, they're looking for, I'm guessing, any kind of game or anything possible because they just don't have anything to eat. Right. They're experiencing sort of a biblical-style plague against them. Almost. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, their crops are failing. Of their own doing. You know, there's all kinds of curses going on. And we don't know. There's some sort of witchcraft afoot, maybe. Possibly. Possibly. Um, or William just didn't realize how difficult it was actually going to be. And actually, this next segment is kind of a manifestation of the witchcraft. Um, do you want to go into which creature that we're going to meet next? Yeah. Um, I'm excited. So, as they're, they're, they're in the woods, they're walking. Um, William is testing them, I guess, on his his faith or his his knowledge of original sin well his knowledge of original sin but i think it's almost this thing where he's trying to test caleb's knowledge and and understand see if he can understand if caleb's knowledge is truly eternal internal you know so it's something that caleb feels when he relays it back to his father rather than him just kind of spouting off words which is interesting because we kind of feel that whenever we hear thomas and talk to her father her father in biblical terms it's almost like she's just reciting what she's been taught uh to where caleb seems very genuine and caleb seems almost terrified that any moment he's going to commit some unbearable sin that's going to prevent him from going to heaven yeah and also with his with his young brother you know being kidnapped and he probably sees it as like some form of the culmination of all their sins prior to coming out on their own may have manifested this uh, force that took this new and precious life from their family right and i don't think it's this scene but i know he does he does talk about sam you know going to hell and that's kind of a theme too is sam going to hell because he was unbaptized that's no, also it, it is this scene because he's he's kind of trying to find out Caleb's knowledge and Caleb gets so emotionally involved in the conversation that he starts to question everything with Samuel. Right. He starts to wonder like, you know, because there's that point where he says he he wonders he brings up that Sam wasn't baptized and does that mean that Sam's going to damnation? And William kind of plays it off. He, he doesn't even really answer the question. Um, at this point, he, he doesn't want to have anything to do with what, how this pertains to Scripture. It's almost like, no, 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 you're, you're overreacting. Don't worry about it kind of thing. Yeah, and, and also William, the father, is always kind of like, ah, oh, you know, like kind of dismissing everyone. Dismissing any time that somebody questions his choices. I guess. And, and I don't know if we have talked about how, like, you know, William is sort of representing this sort of godlike father figure, yeah, uh, Abraham. That time, the, I mean, it's very mm-hmm. uh, reminiscent of like the whole Abrahamic story. Uh, I mean, which is isn't that some sort of analog for God the Father? Yeah, well, it's it's phenomenal how the Old Testament is laid out because all the, I guess, quote unquote heroes. The figures within the Hebrew Bible that have the ability to bring the community out of some sort of devastation or tragedy. Um, So there's always this one figure, but in so doing, I mean, they're very human, so they make mistakes. You know, they lie or they sometimes cheat. They get into fights. They murder They do all kinds of wild things, and a lot of people look into this and saying how how can anybody follow the Old Testament because there's every everything is flawed. Nobody's perfect. I mean, everyone's a killer and does all this crazy shit and sleeps with their daughters and like sleeps with you know people's wives and it's what the they're not even like the people in the Old Testament that are like in contact with God or whatever you know 
they're fucking scum. Most of them are cr- like, you know, by today's standards, they would be like criminals. Well, and it's a very different world, right? And I think that that's like, I see it as a unfortunate thing in how people look at specifically the Judeo-Christian uh, mythology. I guess we could say that um, because they want to automatically think of these people as we think of people today. They want to think that these people had the same information that we have today. You know, today we're so oversaturated with all kinds of different technologies, right? And so we have very little time to contemplate the wonders of the universe or what's the meaning of life or why are we here? Um, Being that we're the only living things in the world that have the ability to look into the future. Right. I mean... Other animals can do that to an extent, to the extent that their um, instincts lead them to, you know, so it's like, I know I'm going to have to hunt, basically, is what a lion, I would guess, is going through. Um, Yeah, and what the fuck is that shit? Like, honestly, um, why why do animals just do shit that seems not, I mean, I get it, like, you know, maybe... Maybe their brains developed to be able to do that, but it just seems like there's something a little bit more pushing the mechanism of life. I think it is in us too, um, only that we have lost connection with the mother, the divine mother. And in losing this connection, we don't have those primal instincts. You know, I mean, we may experience them in regards to sex, and I can't think of anything else that's stronger you know, because even hunger, as Americans, we have no idea what hunger is. We have no idea what it means to be famished. Yeah, of um, you know, uh, we have it better than so many other countries. I mean, we're not the best country. Um, I don't think there is a best country. You know, we're all flawed in our own different ways. Um, but in regards to America, we have it really great. You know, we really do. Um, there's a reason why people come to America. There's a reason why people are able to experience their dreams you know and it just seems that when an american born and raised does not experience these same dreams then it's a flawed system yeah and what these fucking commie fucks don't understand is like it was that sort of entrepreneurial like spirit i mean it's just this sort of renegade spirit that made uh the u.s exceptional and and made it what it is today and it, it i mean it made it to the to the most like powerful you know, richest country in the world. People, it, it wasn't. It wasn't a fucking. It wasn't a mistake. I mean, and people won't give us any like credit for that, like whatsoever. No, and I think it's because I don't. Well, I don't know what it is. If it's just too new, too recent in our memory, um, because we were born in this country, because it's somehow laid back in our unconscious that we know what happened. But I mean, there's there's been so many countries, so many cultures that got overran they got taken so to speak you know and so it's interesting that when we speak of the first americans coming over and having confrontation with the native americans and overthrowing them or murdering them or putting them into enslavement and taking over that it's like this thing this taboo or this tragedy that shouldn't happen but I mean, it's probably unknown how many cultures and countries have experienced the same thing. Yeah, and it's all, it's all relative. You have to think about what those times were like. I mean, we can sit back and say, oh, these evil fucking Americans or whatever, they killed the Indians and all this shit. And it's like, that was the... You can't say Indian. That was like the status quo. Okay, sorry, Native American. That was the status quo of that time. It was like conquer or be conquered, conquer, kill or be killed. Exactly. And it was the same right. on the, the continent of North America. The Native Americans were doing it to each other. Exactly. And, exactly. And that's not even to say that, that it's okay. Yeah, it's you not know, okay. Accept it and it's fine, you know. But it's kind of a part of nature, man. I mean, that's exactly what happens with lions, right? You have the male lion. He gets too old. There's a, a new lion somewhere out in the in the far reaches of this same wilderness, uh, they come in and they test the male that's in charge of the pride. And if the male that's in charge of the pride cannot fend and def- himself and defeat this other lion, he's going to lose his pride. And he's a wanderer now. Yeah, and obviously, Everywhere. obviously, if they had superior weapons, it would have been the same 
for you know right well and take chimps for example um chimps are pretty fucking brutal you know oh, yeah uh, so it, it's everywhere so i think that it's it's all these reasons why we've lost our connect we've lost our connection to nature basically um everything that we interchange with is um artificial yeah and we've lost a connection to the hierarchy too right or even to acknowledge that it exists when that's the that's the basic rule of nature. Right. And people want to, you know, people want to dismiss that. I mean, that's the fundamental fucking number one rule about nature. Like, what the fuck, dude? Like, yeah, get with it, you know? So getting back to the Old Testament, um, they're all flawed. Any way, any way that you shape them, they're all flawed. And even that, uh, I guess you would say Yahweh, right? Um, or Jehovah. But this figure is also flawed, which is something that has caused constant conflict, you know, because people can't understand how such a loving God could be so terrible. But it, it's a message. It's, it's trying to tell you that we're all flawed, no matter how high up we are in the, art, in the hierarchy. We all have the ability to make mistakes and do terrible things. And even if we don't do them, we still think them, you know, and that's why I think that people like the puritans took it to the extent of whatever's in your mind might as well be manifested that's the way that they treated it right so um i would say that william definitely has some of the archetypal uh foundations that you can find in yahweh as well as abraham right because part of the story of abraham is that you know he's he's an old man right he's like in his late seventies or early eighties, and he's still living at home with his father. And at some point he receives this revelation from God saying, you got to get out. You got to take your people and you got to get out, you know? So that's what happens. You know, Abraham leaves, uh, he treks in the wilderness and he experiences suffering and he experiences tragedy. Um, and I think that's exactly what we see in William. You know, he had this conflict he had this revelation that he had to leave. He gathers up his family and he decides he's going to go into the wilderness. And it's so, yeah, it's it's perfectly connected. And as we find out later, he's definitely willing to sacrifice his children if it if it comes to it. That's really hard. If it comes down to it. It's really hard because it seems like, well, maybe it's just because Thomason is the most mature. Right. So she's reaching that age where she's going to discover herself She's going to try and discover other things. Um, and she has the ability to completely overshadow William, right? Because she's very powerful. I mean, all the kids look up to her. She takes care of them all. Um, she seems to be the one that's in constant contact with them. So I think that that's intimidating for both William and Kate. Yeah, interesting thing too. Uh, later on, what I would call the... Thomason and William in the garden uh, scene. Yeah, which he had one with Caleb earlier, mm -hmm. and now we're now we're seeing Thomason. Uh, uh, basically, you kind of see you kind of see him looking at her as a peer in that scene. Uh, they're having a discussion, and he's kind of figured out that she's like a witch or whatever, and he kind of like has this like it's this sort of respect a little bit of respect it's you know that I mean? it's that thing it's exactly what it's you like, say okay you're on you're on the level with right me, he of. experiences it like this isn't i mean she's still my daughter but this isn't my little girl anymore yeah this uh, is a powerful being yeah so like not to be messed with right and what does he do about that you know like how does he keep his i don't know his fatherly aspect but at the same time defending his place in the hierarchy and especially the fact that this hierarchy could be overthrown by this teenage girl. And you, you actually even see him almost relent or give up a little bit. Or mm -hmm. he's just sort of, you know, at one point he gets tired and he's just kind of like, you know. But she right, keeps whatever. pushing. Yeah, yeah. She keeps pushing, right? It's that same thing, you know, so that that nomad lion is coming in and he's slowly going to push his way to the point where there's going to be conflict. And that's exactly what she's doing. Yeah, eats the lions from the lion's den, yeah. right? Right. So um, they're in the forest, William and Caleb, and amidst this conversation, uh, they they see a hare, you know, H-A-R-E, right. just in case, no confusion. We love hares here. Um, 
so then they act right they start to load the gun and um at that point william targets at the at the hair and pulls the trigger but the gun backfires right in the eye right in the eye which is another mythological concept in that in the osiris isis mythology right um what happens is osiris becomes the blind father he's he's blind to everything that's going on around him um but he's willfully blind so it's not only that he's become old and decrepit but he's actually given up on trying to see further than his infinite doom i guess so in doing so he's seen as weak and it's at this point that his brother set comes in to the picture and sets eventually the name um, transitions into Satan once we right. get into the Hebrew mythology. Um, but Set overthrows Osiris. You know, he, he I believe he murders him. Um, and if he doesn't murder him, he sends him down into, you know, the unknown abyss, which is basically the same thing anyway. And so Isis, uh, Osiris's wife, uh, cuts off his phallus and impregnates herself with it um, or something like that. I mean, this could be, oh, yeah. but the basic mm-hmm. idea is the same. Either way, it's a phallus, whether it's one she cuts off from him or one that she fashions on her own. So she gets the phallus, she impregnates herself, and she gives birth to Horus. And Horus um, defeats Set. And the interesting thing is that the story doesn't just stop there. Um, because at that at this point, he's the hero, right? I mean, the hero's journey, you could say, has been completed. Right. But he realizes that he is only true to himself and true to being itself if he rescues his father from the underworld. So he rescues Osiris. And not only does he rescue Osiris, but he gives Osiris one of his eyes. So, I re- so Osiris has gained the vision of youth once more. So Horus not only becomes the hero, but almost transcends the hero. Wow. That's very interesting. Right. So the fact that William shoots himself in the eye, and again, this is just my interpretation, is an allegory to the fact that he's become willfully blind to the way in which he is putting his family in danger. And he has sacrificed his family, his entire family, for his pride. And so it's almost like this, well, excuse the term, but God smack. Right. right? Like, wake up. It's time to wake up. You know, you need to see what what's in the future. I mean, that's what the consciousness is. Right. And when you were talking about how we've lost our connection to nature and you were talking about, you know, why it is that we don't have the same primal drives that we used to. Um I think that's another thing, too, is because we're so high in consciousness, there's so much that we need to be aware of constantly. We're constantly making decisions. We're constantly thinking in the future and in the past and in the present simultaneously uh, in complicated ways that overlap that we just don't ever even think about. Uh, And so I think that consciousness and that ability to see has caused us to also become lesser in our primal instincts right because i mean the memory takes over and you kind of do these things on autopilot every day every day and so it's just like you know people describe how you know you walk through a city and you don't you don't actually recognize the buildings your your mind just makes a map of the things that are supposed to be around you right you don't even see them you don't see the details and why is that certain images sink in and others don't they just pop right out I mean, are you in control of that? No telling. Um, so the hair actually wasn't part of the New England folklore. It's actually something from England. So it wasn't it wasn't so much something that would necessarily be appropriate in the story, but the family is from England, so possibly it is that it's like it caused it to manifest itself in that particular way. And I also think that that's a big reason why the f- the witch has unfortunately not been brought to awareness as it should be because people don't understand certain mythologies because uh, from my understanding, Eggers specifically kept 
English ideals through the making of this film because the English, uh, I guess, what could you say, collective consciousness is goes farther than the American does. Right. So he talks about how he wanted to cast people who were knowledgeable of Shakespeare because he didn't want to have to teach them or sorry, not knowledgeable of Shakespeare, but knowledgeable of old English because he didn't want to have to teach people how to speak in old English. He wanted it to be people that knew how to do it. Um, and then things like mythologies, like the hair, um, there were some other things, but he wanted to have English actors because yeah, all, all English, all English cast. It's deep in there. Uh, that's a very important note. I think, uh, yeah, all, all the whole cast right? from England. And amazing. Absolutely amazing. Especially little kids. I can't believe how like mature they are. Like they talk like adults. Yeah, I thought it was really funny in the special features when they talk about uh, Mercy. and Oh, yeah, being like an old lady. Yeah, a little old lady. <laughs> just yelling. Child. Yeah. Just yelling and being cantankerous. So, um, so, yeah, anyways, the gun backfires. He obviously misses the hair and they go chasing after it. Or does Fowler run away and they go chasing after Fowler? I, I can't remember. Yeah, I think Fowler runs away and they go chasing after him. So before we move on, uh, there was a thought that we were running across whenever we were speaking about the Old Testament and this idea that they were somehow flawed because we are comparing them to the way that we live now. We were saying how distracted we are by technology and things of that nature, right? And just how we have so much, so many more things to worry about that it's oftentimes hard to just sit back and think, to be alone with our thoughts. I mean, in most places in this country, you can't even see the night sky. So you have to think about these people who didn't really have so many distractions as we do now. I mean, they had distractions, but they were they were different and I guess more meaningful. So you could just imagine, you know, they're sitting outside, you know, by a fire, looking up at the night sky and just contemplating life, contemplating what existence really is. And that's how all these mythologies got started, you know, because they had nothing, I don't want to say nothing better to do, but maybe the most important thing that they could do was think of what it meant to be the people that they were. And so you have these stories that are written to kind of explain that, you know, it's like this, I don't even want to say primitive because I don't even think they're primitive, but it's this um, archaic thought of how we're to make, how we are to make sense of all of this. Yeah, and I mean, all they have to do is uh, sit around and kind of think about their environment and uh, talk and go go on about like thinking about the creatures in their world, right? And kind of trying to make sense of those because there's not really biology books or anything like that. So everything right. you encounter is kind of a, a monster. There's no uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson podcast that you can listen to <laughs> to like understand what the moon is. You know, it's they had no idea and when you look up at the night sky even having the knowledge that we have it's mesmerizing it's confusing it's terrifying you know when you really think about it so i don't understand how we can look down on on stories that, that are written like in the bible oh yeah i actually have a personal anecdote about this you know this was this is a while back maybe like a year ago um we were camping uh let's see where were we it was around the catwalk area um, like, oh, Glenwood, actually. Glenwood Forest. It's in New Mexico. Um, which, that'll give you our location somewhere in New Mexico. Fucked up, man. Oh, shit. <laughs> Docks ourselves. Anyway, so my family was gathered around a campfire, and we started looking at the night sky, and this, this night it was particularly clear, and you could see literally every, every definition. You could see the Milky Way. Just a beautiful spectacle. We were out in the middle of the woods, and it was just completely dark. Um, and I felt that it was this, this real primal kind of like, and it gave us like this feeling of this deep connection. And we kind of were pointing out the constellations and my brother's kind of like an astronomy kind of, um, expert or, you know, he's very interested in it. And it was just this, it was this real primal feeling, this, uh, real crazy feeling of connectedness with, with the universe kind of. You know, you're, you're feeling the divine, you know, cause oh, yeah. you're just, you're out there and oh, like, it's just this vast, like emptiness. 
Well, what's beautiful is in the mythology behind, we spoke about it in the previous episode, but the mythology behind the high god of the Gnostic belief system, Abraxas. And in Abraxas' mythology, um, they talk about how there are many gods and how every human being is as is such a god. Mm-hmm. And when you look up at the night sky, every star represents a god. And the darkness that lies between is Abraxas. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, looking up at the night sky can be terrifying. Yeah, and it can also be uh, very meaningful. And, and I kind of I kind of mark that as like, you know, it's one of my favorite memories because it's just our family. And, you know, in this age of technology where we don't really pay attention and, you know, everyone was on their cell phones at that time. But just this, we, we kind of gather together to just marvel at the, the universe in a sense, you know? Yeah, I and mean. Just, it was really overwhelming. It was really like emotionally like overwhelming almost, you know? It still is. I mean, it's beautiful when you really look up at the sky and you contemplate it. But it even goes further, you know. I mean, when you just look at, there are so many scenes within the witch, um, where trees take on an identity; they become an entity of sorts. And for me personally, I see that all around me all the time. Oh yeah, they're definitely like sentient beings. Yeah, and especially if you've had any kind of psychedelic experience, it only enhances that. Oh, yeah, you definitely can see. Secures that belief. You, so, can, see, you can see those fuckers breathing. You yeah. Know, pulsing, pulsating with life. Yeah, I mean, um, my second DMT experience, um, when I came out of it, I looked up at the night sky, and it was alive. And there was um, a certain constellation of stars that were obvious eyes and the mouth or the gleaming of the lip of I would call the great mother and she had this smile and this sparkle in her eye that was like saying I love you I I love you you know everything's gonna be all right and all the darkness between her was almost like wings pulsating you know, not not in flight or anything like that, but just pulsating, like alive. And all the stars that were gathered around it were, I mean, you could see their, I don't know, maybe their life or their death, but they were flaming, like furiously. You could see the flames on them. Yeah. And um, as, the, as I came out of the experience, all the lights started, or the stars started to dim. Um, they became stars the darkness in between started to meld into the background of the abyss and the mother's face got gentler and gentler and gentler until she was gone. And ever since that experience, I've never been able to look at the night sky the same again. Oh yeah. It's that, it's that universal love. I mean, uh, it's sort of that duality of things. So it's like you stare into the night sky and, uh, you know, you know, one thing is that you're you're so far away from everything, and everything is just this vast emptiness. But at the same exact time, you know that you're not alone in the universe, and that there's something, there's some sort of benevolent force right. at the end of, of what you're staring at. And not only that, but I would also like to say um, everything is something. So like, okay, so like the air, right? It's made up of you know, particles, molecules, that t- I'm not sure about the exact science, but the, the the main point is the fact that there is really no distance between objects. So, like, uh, there's no difference between our flesh and, like, the air, you know, like the air that we breathe or, or anything. So stone. it's all something. It's all one solid thing. Right. So there is no, uh, there is no emptiness. And going further... But there, there's only emptiness, but there's nothing... There is no emptiness. Oh. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, I mean, that also ties into mythology, to the mythology of Abraxas. Because the idea is, so long as we exist or existence exists within what we consider to be reality, you have these opposites, right? But it's not until existence ceases to exist... And you experience union with Abraxas, 
that all these opposites turns in turn into positive and negative charges. So they cancel themselves out. So within Abraxas, everything exists while simultaneously nothing exists. And yeah, that's um, I'm fuck yeah, like that's exactly. So I mean, yeah, that's the that's the mode of existence. I mean, for a computer too, it's like there's like neutral, there's on and off, whatever you know what I mean. So it's like it's that. It's that sort of try thing. It's it always comes back to threes. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. It's that sort of. There's nothing, a reason why there's a trinity. Nothing. The baseline and then the apex. Right. I mean, and that describes every fucking thing that we experience or don't experience in life. Yeah. I mean, it's really literally you could break it down that into that. And I mean, Christ. I mean, just anything like it's it's always represented in mythology. Well, and what, every uh, seven years, every cell in our body regenerates, so it's not even its own? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's true, but it's it's funny because they make fun of that as like one of uh, Joe Rogan's kind of oh. <laughs> bro science things. Like, dude, oh. don't you know your body? Like, you know, <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, it is true. Like, uh, right, uh, something like that, place. whatever, something like that. fucking look it up, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. But, um... Well, and and going back to what you're saying about how everything is related, I mean, going further back, we all came from the exact same point of becoming. So right. we're all the same. I mean, no matter what, if if you're religious or if you're spiritual or if you're atheistic or you're agnostic, no matter what, I mean, you can't deny the fact that we all came from the exact same point. So long as you believe in, you know, evolution and whatnot. And unfortunately, reductionists, you guys can't explain uh, wh- why, you know, or what, or Not where. only that, but you I mean... You can't explain shit. So we take the Big Bang, right? So it's like this, it's this condensed point that is no bigger than a thumbnail. I mean, you can literally hold it in the palm of your hand. And... The moment just before everything becomes what we know it is today, we don't know what existed before that. I mean, we know that there was something that came before the Big Bang. You know, it's like, I don't even know, a point zero 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 of a second. And just before that, we have no knowledge of. Yeah, and there's no way of us conceptualizing that. There's no way of us measuring it. And... There's no way of explaining it. So to to just say the Big Bang exp- explains it all is fucking that's nonsense. Right. And so what's really interesting about this is if we look into Jewish mythology and Jewish mysticism, there's a whole every letter within the Hebrew alphabet has its own independent meaning, its own number, and if you combine words or if you combine letters, they have other meanings, right? So what's really, really interesting is the second letter within the Hebrew alphabet is the letter bet. And the way bet is written is it's almost like, a, it, well, it's, you can visualize it as an open square, right? So you only have three sides of the square. Okay. And what it signifies, so the lines... The definitive line in the letter bet comes before anything that precedes it or anything that comes after it. So in the Jewish mysticism, what they say is that bet symbolizes that idea that we don't know what came before our existence. And that's what that one letter within Jewish mysticism symbolizes is that which we do not know before being came into being. Oh, wow. So there, there's actually like a word for it? Yeah. Wow. It's phenomenal. That's crazy. So anyways, um, so William misses the hair. And the hair has many different symbolisms behind its mythology. Um, it's known as the trickster, the coward, the deceiver, the creator. It's the messenger of goddesses. Um, it's the manifestation of the witch. But it's also an allegory to suicide. Um, but I think most well known in regards to the hair mythology is its connection to fertility. 
And there's a lot of allegories to fertility within the witch. And in regards to the hair, I don't think that in regards to fertility that it's sexual. I believe what it means is that William is unable to build a relationship with Mother Earth. He's unable to plant his seed into Mother Earth and sprout a good harvest. So the hair symbolizes fertility in the natural aspect, not the sexual aspect. So when William misses his target, the hair, he it's it's symbolic of him missing the target, missing the mark of trying to bring forth life from the Divine Mother. Now, the word sin comes from the Greek term harmartia, which means to miss the mark. So sin actually literally means to miss the mark. So right here we can say that William in, it's, it's, the unconscious is speaking to William telling him that he's missing the mark. He is in fact sinning. And the word harmartia, which means to miss the mark, is specific to aiming at a target. So all the way around, we see William missing the aim of his specific or intended target. Damn, I didn't know. I don't know any of that. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I think in this context, um, there might have even been like a reference to uh, like the hair is like a symbol of something causing you to, you know, Stray from your path. Oh, oh straight from your chosen path. Your yeah. chosen path. Yeah. Right. And also that which deceives you into the incorrect path in its symbolism of the trickster or the deceiver. Yeah, and it leads you into doom. Right. So William is unable to bring forth crop properly. Um, so he is an insufficient reaper, so to speak. And just as... So within the Old Testament, when Cain murders Abel, he brings death into the world. So Cain is symbolic of death. Cain brings death. Cain is also the first um, grave digger, Mm -hmm. the first uh, to ever bury another human being. Oh, yeah. Right. And so within certain satanic ideologies... um, Cain's name, well, I guess in Hebrew, but in Hebrew, um, I I think, anyways, I don't want to misspeak, so I'm going to stick with what I know, but Cain means spear. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that when we take the word sin, which means to miss the mark, and we take Cain, whose name means spear, Cain murdering Abel was like the ultimate missing of the mark for his spear. It's the ultimate sin. You know, he... Yeah, exactly. So this also represents William in that the fact that he's unable to reap properly and he's unable to make a proper sacrifice, the reaper must come and collect his own. So since William can't be the reaper, the archetype of the reaper comes in. And that's when we see true tragedy start to befall the family well i guess you could say samuel was true tragedy but it just it keeps going yeah an escalating right an escalating doom yeah exactly okay now that we've covered the hair we're going to meet another animal friend um probably my favorite animal out of this whole film and it probably should be anybody's because it's the most exciting character of the film. Here we meet Black Philip. That's right, Black Philip the goat. Get back! You can stop that! There was a lot of, um, when the film first came out, comparisons to Cujo and how Black Phillip was the Cujo of this generation. What? Mm-hmm. I don't even see, like, a connection at all. I guess it's just, you know, 
an animal that kills. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, so uh, Black Phillip is played by Charlie the Goat uh, in his goat form, of course. They should have never let known its true name. Oh, well, I know you're a man of mystery, but sometimes you got to know the background of the story. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyway, Black Phillip comes in, um, and I have on my notes here, Black Phillip comes into frame as twins chase and sing his theme song, which is the Black Phillip song. Uh, We meet Jonas and Mercy. We'll talk about them in a minute. But first... Let's ha- let's examine the lyrics to Black Philip. Okay, so it begins as Black Philip, Black Philip, a crown grows out of his head. Right. So a crown being well the horns, of course. Yeah, of course. But it's also I would say an interplay with the idea of the crowned Messiah, which we see in Christ. Which uh in the last episode we were talking about Gnosticism and I was speaking about how there is a connection between Christ and the serpent. And one of the interesting things is again, when we get into Hebrew mythology, um, they have this concept where letters have certain numbers. And if any word or phrase has the same sum total, they in essence mean the same thing. I don't remember the specific number, but I want to say that Jesus' name adds up to 358, and so does Nachash, which is the Hebrew name for the serpent in the Garden of Eden. So they both have the same numerical value. So within Hebrew mythology and the Jewish mysticism, they are the one and the same being. And we could also see that as like, you know, uh, Christ and the adversary, um, the savior, savior and the deceiver. And so here, if we are to say that Black Philip represents the figure of Satan, then we can breach that connection. Right. Because he's the king. He's the king. A crown grows on his head. It's his horns. He's a sick fuck. All right, so. <laughs> okay, so the next line is, To Nanny Queen is wed. And I have scratched my head over and over about this. I have no fucking clue what it is. I try to look up no, things. No, you got it, dude. I, I mean, I try, to, I try to look up things online. But, okay, so first of all, we have to... This lends itself to the question of... Is this a song that's been personalized to Jonas and Mercy? All oh, right, has been you know given to them as something to recite because and by whom and by whom right? And so on the surface, it just seems like a harmless kind of like you know a little song that kids might know, you know, a little folk song or whatever. Right. I don't know if that's what they're called, folk songs. The but, original folk song is fucking <clears throat> Black Phillip. Yeah, some sort of a little little nursery rhyme or something. That they're doing, but I mean, it could be that they've been fed this song by the Black Philip, right? And meant to like kind of like chant it for him because he's the king. And you kind of see it. So, in this scene, like Black Philip rears his horns and he's jumping up and he's kind of like chasing after the kids. And you could, you could tell that he's like menacing them and they're like enjoying it. It's such an iconic scene, yeah, yeah, it is because, beautiful. And he's kind of chasing them around and they're kind of it's kind of like a you know, I don't know what the shot's called, but it's like it follows him around. Right, and it's all, kind of, almost like a cat and mouse kind of thing. You know, they're antagonizing him, but he's allowing them to. And at the same time, he's scaring them, but not really. And there's there's almost too much to this scene to hold on to. So, I mean, you can get wrapped up in it because, I mean, there's so much shit going on, so much, like, allegory and kind of, you know, he's t- he's, like, menacing the kids, he's taunting them, but he's also... Like, they're also enjoying it, too. So they're kind of, like, giving into it. Yeah, and when I saw that scene in the trailer, I mean, if if the rest of the film was terrible, it would have been worse the segments that we get to see Black Philip. Oh, of course. What an iconic character. 
Um, so yeah, to Nanny Queen is wed. So I mean, if this was a personalized song, they could be talking about Thomason. You know, if you know, if she is in fact in fact the witch at this point. Right. Well, I mean, she is their nanny, right? In all yeah, and she's and purposes. Kinda, yeah, and you know, she's the one that takes care of Samuel. So and... Jonas and Mercy are almost singing this revelation to where anybody who's paying attention, they're almost like outlining what's going to happen. I mean, oh, yeah, exactly. So what, that's the second line, and they're already telling us yeah, they're that already saying. Thomason is basically going to be, uh, I don't know. The devil's bride, pretty much. One of the many. Yeah, and uh, the next part's kind of mundane. It's like, uh, jump to the fence post, running in the stall, Black Philip, Black Philip, king of all. So, of course. I mean, is it the stall of the world? You know, because there's also that idea that the devil is the lord of the world. So, I mean, if we take that the boundaries of the earth are the fence posts and Black Philip is king of it all, then the devil rules over the earth. Yeah, and it's also, too, like, he's actually being contained, but at the same time, he's not. He's the king. He's, like, the king of everything. He right. controls it all. So he's being contained, but he's, like, that doesn't matter because he's... His power is... And he still needs a bride. Oh, right. Okay, and the next stuff is sort of just your normal satanic fare. Black Philip, Black Philip, king of sky and land, king of sea and sand. You know, of course, the the whole nature allegory. Do we know who wrote this? Um, If not, that's nah, fantastic. You know, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I should know, but I don't know. Hopefully not, because it just adds to the folklore, right? I mean, you could easily argue that this is an original folk song that was discovered, almost. You know what I mean? Or yeah, uh, because we don't know its origin. Oh, it'd be so cool if that was like real, right? What if it's real? And oh, Jesus Christ, I'd be like so stoked if it was like a real, yeah. Something that someone thought they had like a goat and it was like fucking. Well, and he did kids. that a lot in this film, right? He, he that's the whole basis of the film, right? He used actual diary excerpts, you know. So he he used all kinds of things that were original in their conceptual form, and he kind of changed it for the film. So you know, maybe it wasn't Black Phillip specifically, but there was some other name, right? That's really interesting. But yeah, the whole nature thing, the Wiccans and the witches and the fucking Satanists and all, they're crazy about <laughs> the earth and stuff. I guess we should all be. Oh, yeah, true. But I mean, it's okay. Like, so that's its significance. So mm -hmm. they're all about the whole, he, he, you know, he's of the earth, you know, oh, rather than being whatever. Uh, so yeah, we are ye see we we are ye servants. We are ye men. Black Philip eats the lions from the lion's den, which is such a sick fucking passage. But it's you know it has origins. Possibly, I mean, my interpretation is so. If we look into Gnostic mythology, we have the figure of the demiurge, which we also spoke of in the last episode, and. The Demiurge they describe as having the face of a lion. So within the Gnostic mythology, the idea is that the Demiurge is the false god. So we have to overcome the Demiurge. So from a Gnostic perspective, we could see this as, yeah, I mean, Black Philip is trying to get rid of the Demiurge, the artificer, the false god, the one that thinks he rules the world, but in fact doesn't. Yeah, exactly. So now we meet the twins, Jonas and Mercy, in the same scene. And they're played by, let's see, Lucas Dawson plays Jonas. And Ellie Granger plays Mercy. And these kids, I'd say, were about five years old. Is that? Yeah, younger? I would say around there. Yeah, five to seven, maybe. And there was some talk on the bonus features about how 
you know, at this age, at that time, they were supposed to already be, you know, functional members of society and kind of hold their own weight pressure. on the farm and all this pressure and stuff. So that's why they're they're such sophisticated uh, kids is because, you know, they have to be adults. So, of course, they probably chose the smartest, like, brightest, like, kid to oh, play the yeah. parts. I mean, you just listen to their interviews in the behind the scenes and you're just it's like... It's mind-blowing. It's like you're listening to an adult speak. I don't even talk that well. Yeah, I don't talk that good. <laughs> I don't talk so good. But yeah, we meet uh, Jonas and Mercy. Do you have any, Do you think there's any sort of symbolism behind the whole twins, the male and female twins? Kind of. No. Does that represent anything to you? No. I, I'm sure that I'm sure there is some sort of subtext there. Yeah, I mean, we could just see it as like the duality, you know. So Black Philip has engaged or manifested a duality within the family because we can say that he's all powerful right i mean that's kind of what the film has suggested so being that he's so powerful he could have built a relationship with anybody within the family and for some reason he chose these two specifically right and um now we see this very symbolic scene um William returns from his hunting trip with Caleb and his entire world is in chaos. Uh, we see it physically represented in the scene. Uh, Black Philip is running around taunting the kids. He comes back and he's like, what is this? You know, like right. there's this goat chasing the kids and like the kids are misbehaving. It's uh, out of its pen. Like how yeah, did that the happen? mom's yelling and like there's, there's all this chaos going on. So this, what this represents to me is what we call uh, getting your house in order. What Jordan Peterson would call getting your house in order. Yeah, what Jordan Peterson would call. <laughs> Which you'll hear a lot of uh, Peterson references here. We're sorry, but uh, we love the man. We think he's like a, kind of a prophet. He's an amazing man. Um, I really think that we are in the middle of witnessing a person who is going to change the future. And I, I know that may sound a little hippie or I don't know, but there's just something about him. And I think that if you are against Peterson or you think he's full of shit, I don't think that you have... I don't think you've immersed yourself far enough, deep enough. You know, I, don't listen to his political stuff. But uh, listen to his lectures as a professor. Um, he has his personality lectures, his maps and meaning lectures, and they're phenomenal. And all of these lectures happen before any of his current um, his current status as being a personality. So you can really understand that he's had passion for these kinds of thoughts before any of this happened. Yeah, and we're we're really witnessing this person that's really uh, channeling the the divine, I would say, in a very significant way, and he's really changing the way that people think, and um, uh, positively. Yeah, and well, I mean, if you if you listen to all this stuff, it's extremely positive, right? And you know, every so often there's a figure that comes out and kind of puts their finger on the pulse of humanity and tries to direct it in a positive direction. And we're currently witnessing that with Jordan Peterson. Um, it's hard these days with our current knowledge, right? With social media, um, with the internet, we have the ability to know everything that we want to know. So I don't think we have the appreciation for somebody like Peterson. You know, back when Nietzsche existed, you know, none of this technology existed so what he had to say was profound and people paid attention but with jordan peterson it's just so easily easy in this day and age to mull over it because we're saturated with information yeah and a, a great indicator of you know the fact that he's doing something that's that's really significant is is these he has the nihilist shook i mean they're terrified of his message and it changed the way that I thought about it, too, because 
it's very easy to see the tragedy that's life and to not understand or not be willing to accept what it means to be human. And he turned that on its head. I mean, that's that's what it means to be human, to suffer, to experience tragedy, because it's only when you experience tra- tra- tragedy and suffering that you grow. You know, every mistake that you make, every heartache that you have, it teaches you something. And it's the same idea as manifesting the order that's in chaos. Yeah, that's that's his uh, entire message, really. Right. It's just making, you know, uh, what is it the, you know, <laughs> help me with the chaos thing. Like, it's like, uh, like the logos is what is, it took chaos and that's what it made the world with. Yeah. So chaos is absolute potential. <clears throat> so everything that can happen, everything that's ever happened and everything that is happening now resides within chaos. So there's this idea. Well, it's easy to think of chaos as a negative structure. You know, there's nothing good in it because we, we think about it in our current terms, right? So if your life is in chaos, your life isn't going so well, but we have to see that chaos is symbolic and chaos is its own archetype. So within chaos is absolute potential. And when the high God spoke, he spoke order into that chaos. So the logos was the ability to pull all the potential that's in chaos and order it. So the logos is the ordering principle. Yeah, and and only these nut jobs would be upset about a Canadian telling you to clean your room. (laughs) Right? Yeah, I mean... um... I mean, it's it's fucking absolutely insane that anybody's like against this guy because he's. I mean, his message is wholly positive. Well, and they only, and I think that's because they've only focused on the negative aspects of his political statements, and I don't even consider them negative. You know, um, Jordan Peterson is not against the transgender community. He's not against transgender people at all. He's not against gay people. He's not against people of color or any specific ethnic groups. All he said was that he did not want to be forced to say certain things. Yeah, he, he didn't want to use the language of an oppressive ideology that he doesn't agree with. Right, because... And that's it. And that's the whole of it. What he sees is that it's a very slippery beginning. Because once we accept that we are going to be told to say certain things or speak in certain ways, then those verbal manifestations become actual physical manifestations. So it's, I believe he's trying to stop it before it gets into a situation that we're not ready for, that we don't currently comprehend. Yeah, I mean, these people just, they hate the idea of uh, individual freedom and sort of liberty. And that's why I'm saying, like, don't listen to his political stuff. Don't watch any of his videos. Or ours, for that matter. Right. You know, uh, get into his lectures, get into his biblical series, because it's amazing. And I mean, even if you are an atheist and you don't believe in the Bible or anything like that, it's you have to understand that it is a story. It's the story of our becoming. It's the refinement of all the stories that came before it. Right. And it's it's obviously meaningful. Yeah. I mean, the fact that it exists all well, these thousands of years later. And what fictional story have you read where there was, wasn't tragedy, where there wasn't suffering, where the main character didn't make mistakes? I mean, it's it's in all of the greatest novels. It's pretty much the framework for a- any story. Right. So to scoff at the Bible because it's it has these, I don't know, um, negative aspects to me is a bit naive oh it's extremely naive i mean it's it's just these children that don't don't really understand well and that goes for the believers too right because that's the problem that we see with william is that um the word of the bible is holy which it is but you have to understand 
the true meaning behind these words. So when you take them superficially for their definitions, um, you're missing the entire point. Yeah, and I, I know they mean well, but it's sure. like you, you sort of get into this dogmatic way of thinking and it sort of robs you of your individual liberty. And I think that's I think that that's antithetical to the um, sort of what what uh like the god figure wants whatever you know yeah and it's a piece of literature that has withstood the the stand of time i mean it's it's seriously timeless i mean there are stories within the bible that we have no idea of their origin and when they started so for one piece of literature to be able to withstand thousands and thousands of years means something and i think you're doing yourself a disservice if you're ignoring that yeah, exactly. So, we have William. He's coming back to bring order from the chaos. Uh, his family is completely um, physically represented here. They're completely out of control. Yep. And Black Philip is out of control. <laughs> and he's causing the kids to be out of control, too. Right. And so, this sort of lends itself to you know, what, what happens later on in the story. Well, and it's a really fascinating point that you brought out because if we take, if, if we look at this from a mythological perspective, we have Philip, he's chaotic. He's bringing chaos he into chaos. this scene. He is chaos, right? So he needs an ordering principle in order to balance him because I mean, these animals were very important to the people of these times, you know, but obviously somehow they have lost their connection to Philip as well. Right. So now we get into our second incest scene, which uh, Thomason is ordered to undress her father. So I guess this is some sort of a... Sort of a cleansing kind of thing. It's really weird because, you know, I mean, he's such a large man. And compared to her, it's like, it, it doesn't make sense that she's undressing him, you know? I mean, he's not injured. Oh, yeah, exactly. So later on, we see a little bit of what we call slut shaming. Because <laughs> Thomason's chided. Are you going to chide me on a cop? Thomason gets chided for undressing her father. And she's called a slut and all this stuff. Oh, right. And I think, you know, that's kind of fucked up. Yeah, she's doing what she's supposed to. Because the mother told her to do it. Yeah, and this this was the only scene where you could be like, okay, like that's probably what she's referring to when later right. on whenever she's like, you proud slut. Right. You fucking, you know. Yeah. You seduce your father and your brother and all these people. Right, because I told you to. Just because she's, you know, that's kind of fucked up because she's just a young lady, you know? She can't help that she's, you know, attractive. Yeah. So that's pretty fucked up. And we hear it, the triple F are against slut shaming in all forms, unless you're a slut. Once order is restored to the family and to the farm we see William chopping wood right William does a lot of wood chopping yeah throughout the film he does a lot of wood chopping yeah and there's a there's a point later on in the film when Thomason actually confronts him with all of his wood chopping um, so maybe there's nothing to it but it does come up quite a bit, so I thought that it was important to try and look into what the wood chopping might symbolize. And to me, I think what it symbolizes is it's an unconscious attempt at challenging and defeating the forest or the woods or the divine mother. Ah. Right? So like it's the so he's not even aware that he's doing it. So they're in the midst of the woods. The woods are completely taking over the family. Um, they're being consumed slowly by nature. Fuck. So he's like subconsciously sitting here chopping at wood, trying to kill, trying to slay this dragon, right? Because the archetype of the Divine Mother is both manifested within the woods, the forest, um, and it's also sim 
the terrible aspect of the Divine Mother is that of the dragon, which we see in mythology from who knows how far back. So yeah, I think that's what it symbolizes is unconsciously William is trying to slay the dragon, but he doesn't know how. Dude, that's insane. You've been like withholding that for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've like asked you like, what, what does this mean? You know, there were so many times where I let slip certain things that I discovered and like you had this genuine reaction that is now forever lost. So I didn't want to do that with this one. And that's so fucking hard because, you know, we research the shit and it's like you find a gym and you want to tell you, you know, you like, this is crazy. It. Like you want to tell your friend, mm-hmm. you know, that you're working on this project, but you're going to be like, oh, I have this extreme revelation. But it's good that we kind of keep things from each other so that uh, when we actually express it, it, it comes out genuine. Right. And so, I mean. And yeah, like that, us... I was shocked. Like I didn't know that shit. Yeah. Or I didn't even think, I didn't think about that. It was pretty startling when, I don't want to say I discovered it, but when the idea just came to me. See, I kind of thought of it as like a sort of distraction from his duties. And it certainly can be. Maybe that's like the conscious aspect of it where he's consciously just trying to distract himself let out his anger his frustrations but unconsciously it's way deeper than that yeah and i guess yeah he's he's breaking down the forest he's trying to dismantle what's fucking you know over him which is impossible i mean he'll never do it i mean what he has to do is in this situation not defeat the the wilderness within the forest physically but mentally and emotionally he needs to connect with it he needs to feel it he needs to be at one with it he needs to submit to the mother and the mother will make him fruitful yeah exactly and he, he needs a he needs a sort of tactile relationship mm-hmm. you know with his environment and with his family because that's where he's lacking too he's lacking a relationship with his family wow so that about concludes our second part of The Witch, uh, which is part of a series which we have no idea how many parts there will be. It could go on forever. But next, we are going to get into one of my favorite scenes, and possibly my favorite scene of all cinema, which is the creek scene. Man. I look forward to it. Fucking powerful shit. Anyway... I hope you like enjoyed our conversation. If you've made it this far, we know you're one of the good ones. Thank you so, so much for listening. We put a lot of time and money and brain power into making this a great experience for you. And we hope that you really love it. And we would very much appreciate it if you would uh, subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Follow and like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I would be glad of it. Oh, wow. William, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, also, our email is filmsfatalttotheflesh at gmail.com. This is also our PayPal link. And we're doing this all on our own dime with our own effort while maintaining our own jobs and lives. So if you want to, you can drop us a little bit of coin. We'll never have an ad. We're not these. We're not some of these out of it podcasters that can't seem to put together a meal so they have to sell fucking blue apron uh yeah we're not about that shit that shit's cringe anyway yeah if you can donate then please do i would be glad on it thanks again will and we will be back in about two weeks for the next part i'll see you then friends stay fatal